Hey guys, I'm Chris Buck, and a very warm welcome to Friday Fretworks. And this week, we're taking a look at this Gibson ES335 from 1966. A guitar that I've always loved, but at least in the guitar world, it's kind of universally acknowledged as being the guitar that signaled the end of Gibson's golden era. So, which is it? A dog or a diamond in the rough? <laughs> So what is Gibson's golden era? Now, of course, that term has different meanings for different people, but generally speaking, it's considered to be guitars released between 1948 and early 1965. And when you think of the guitars that were designed and released by Gibson in that period, the Les Paul, the Flying V, the Explorer, the S335, it's no wonder that era has such a strong reputation. And good examples of guitars from specifically the 50s are some of the most sought after and valuable guitars in the world. But where and why did it go so wrong for Gibson in the 1960s? And are guitars made after that golden era really that bad? The start and end of Gibson's golden era aligns near perfectly with one man's tenure as president of the company, Ted McCarthy. Ted, of course, playing a pivotal role not only in the running and the management and the direction of the company, but an unusually heavy part in the actual design of the guitars themselves. And during his time with Gibson, pretty much any electric guitar release could in some way, shape or form be credited to Ted, none more so than the ES-335, of which he was famously proud. But as much as Ted's departure from Gibson in 1966 undoubtedly played a part, it was to be an event on February 9th, 1964, at about quarter to nine Eastern time, that caused ripples across the world that would undoubtedly play a much larger part in Gibson's decline. Ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles! <laughs> It's impossible to overstate the importance of the Beatles' appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show. Aside from signaling a seismic cultural shift, overnight demand for electric guitars went through the roof and subsequently guitar manufacturers were struggling to keep up. Now, For context, in 1964, Gibson sold 1,241 ES-335s. Compare this to 1967, the same model, Gibson sold 5,718. In the months that followed the Beatles' appearance on Ed Sullivan, no less than four TV shows emerged in the US, dedicated to shining a spotlight on new bands. And much to Gibson's chagrin, most of them were playing Fenders. So if not the bolt-on necks or contoured bodies, what was it that people liked about Fender guitars? The logical conclusion that Gibson leapt to were their fast, skinny necks, because that is precisely the direction that they went in. As such, it's those guitars made from 1965 onwards, with a much slimmer neck profile and a much narrower nut width, mean that they not only command considerably less money than their 1964 counterparts, but for many people also signal the end of Gibson's golden era. So what did they change altogether? 
the first real change was the neck profile became substantially smaller, at least generally speaking. I say generally speaking, it's a fairly good caveat to apply to Gibson history and specs just because it's important to remember that these necks in particular were carved by hand and subsequently they can vary from day to day or from carpenter to carpenter. But generally speaking, the neck profile did become smaller. It is, however, the reduction, fairly drastic reduction in the nut width down from 1 and 11 16th down to 1 and 9 16th, a reduction of an eighth of an inch. That is the primary reason that these guitars don't fetch anywhere near as their 1964 counterparts. For example, my 66 cost the best part of £3,000, whereas this 1964 model that I played last year in France was for sale for a cool €22,500. Two years difference between the guitars, £20,000 difference in price. <laughs> If you've never played a Gibson with a smaller nut width, it's hard to describe the sensation of crowding that you can get, at least in those first few frets, especially for those with larger hands, when you're playing chords. Couple that with a skinnier neck profile, and if you're used to throwing a guitar around a bit and wrangling it, as I kind of am guilty of, it can all feel a little bit toy-like under the fingers. Also in 1965, Gibson changed from the much more popular stop bar tailpiece over to the trapeze tailpiece, and over from nickel hardware to chrome. Now all of these specs combined result in a much less valuable guitar, but is it any less of a guitar? The first thing worth mentioning is that if you are looking to get into the vintage guitar market, you could definitely do worse than a narrow nut 65 or 66 ES335. Relatively speaking, in the loosest sense of the word, they are affordable, as I said, relatively speaking, compared to some of the insane prices that vintage guitars can fetch, but you still get the same mojo, the character, the cool, the vibe of a 64-335, but slightly different pedigree, but none of the Clapton spec, kudos and premium attached. No doubt if Clapton took to the Albert Hall stage in 68 for Cream's Farewell Show with a narrow nut 66 335, that would be the specs that we would have spent decades chasing. It very much is luck of the draw in that respect. Yes, the narrow nut width can feel like a little bit of a compromise, arguably less so if you're coming from a Fender background, it's worth saying, but as with any guitar with an unusual neck profile or unusual radius or nut width that I've played in my life, it only really takes the best part of 5 or 10 minutes to get used to it, and even less if you are playing it frequently. The paint number pickups sound fantastic, and as much as I do prefer a stop bar tailpiece, I've never noticed any adverse effects in regards to the tonality or the sustain of the later trapeze tailpiece. Ultimately, I guess I can see why Gibson's made post-1965 aren't considered to be a part of their golden era, but I definitely wouldn't say that they're any lesser guitar for it, only different. And as I said, if you are looking for a relatively affordable, affordable in the loosest sense of the word, entrance into the vintage guitar market, you could definitely do worse than checking out a narrow nut ES335 from, as I said, 65, 66. Judge each guitar on its merits, and depending on your own personal preferences, these may be even more up your street than those golden era 335s. As ever, I'm Chris Buck, I'm going to play you out now on my 66, but thank you very much for watching, please subscribe, hit the bell icon if you haven't already, and I shall see you next week for another episode. Cheers guys, take care, I'll see you soon.